So before we start, I think it's really important to um, draw a line in the sand in relation to how I understand quite slippery concepts in relation to access and equality. Um, I rather like the definition of access here, which is those who need care, and need is really defined by the ability or the capacity to benefit from intervention, either have potential or actual access to it or entry to it. Equity is a really slippery concept. The economists who are here will know all about equity in relation to horizontal equity, at least in relation to taxes, which is around treating equal people equally. People with equal purchasing power, equal wealth, should pay equal taxes. Vertical equity is a rather interesting concept, which is around treating unequal people unequally. So, for example, the, the very rich should pay loads of taxes, and equally, those with less resources should pay less. And there's a lot of this that I want to examine in relation to vertical equity during the course of this presentation. There is a lot of unequal society in relation to, to what I want to examine. So, let's start off. Way back in 1967, um, John Hinton, who was a physician working at St Christopher's Hospice, suggested that we deserve or we emerge deserving of little credit, we who are capable of ignoring the conditions that make mooted people suffer, the dissatisfied there cut noise abroad the negligence they've experienced. It was written in the infancy of the specialty, which bears very little resemblance to anything that we have today in terms of the supply and also its effectiveness. But I think this quote has enormous resonance in 2014, at least in relation to pockets of groups of people or people with particular types of conditions who still leave this world where they have been served poor care or absolutely no care at all. And this sentiment is enshrined in relation to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which is really attempting to permit health and quality of life to flourish across the piece, irrespective of whether people are rich or poor, the colour of their skin, or their condition. So I've been given the very unenviable task of drilling down on some of the hot spots in relation to access and equity at the end of life. My main concern is obviously those with non-malignant conditions, but equally there are numerous other groups that fill the piece in relation to what's reflected in life is often reflected in death as well. I can't do justice to all of these in 15 minutes, but what I am going to talk about are those who are poor and financially disadvantaged, I'm going to talk about older people, and particularly the oldest old, and also those from black and minority ethnic communities. And I think it's really important to mention that none of these issues operate in silos. They often coexist, and one situation may well amplify another. So it's quite possible to be old, and from a black and minority ethnic community, and to be very poor as well, and to experience um, dementia, or to have a non-malignant disease. All of these are compounded and amplified. Yes, I listened to Leonard Cohen, and maybe that says a little bit about me, but this is a really important bit in the song here, the poor stay poor, the rich get rich, that's how it goes, everybody knows. So how does this relate to end of life and palliative care? Let's go back to some of the earliest items of evidence which still have enormous resonance today in 2014. Some of the very seminal work by Anne Cartwright, one of the first survey researchers who attempted to understand the experience of those in their last year of life, <coughs> suggested that social class, and she talks very quaintly about those who are middle class or working class, well, class will either postpone your death in terms of those who are coming from middle and upper classes live longer, but it also quite palpably impacts on your experience of life in your last year of life. And if you can read right down at the bottom here, those who were working class described as having a good quality of life in their last year of life before death had a far poorer quality of life than those who were middle or upper class. Most of the problems orientated around how deep their pockets were, how much money they had in their pockets. If we move on all the way through to SIM study in the mid-1990s, what we can see here from the analysis of death registration data is that those who were working class, social classes four and five, experienced cancer far more frequently than their upper class or social one and two class peers, 
but they were less likely to die in hospices. Somebody once suggested to me that hospices were where posh people died. I question that rhetoric. I think we've made enormous strides to move forward in relation to broadening access to those from disenfranchised population groups. Let's move on to where people want to die most frequently, which is at home. This is a very important piece of work conducted by the Prisma Consortium, which examined people's preferences for location of death and what the telephone poll suggested across seven countries in Europe was that most people would prefer to die at home, closely followed by hospice. Now, what's the reality of the situation? This is work conducted by Irene several years ago with Brian Jarman that attempted to understand the location of death in relation to Jarman indices and UPA scores. And what we can see here over a very long period of time, over 10 years, is that there is a consistent relationship between how deep your pockets are, how deprived or, or how wealthy you are in relation to your location of death marked disparities that are consistent over time and the regression analysis again suggested that and reinforced this finding to highlight that social class or deprivation was strongly and independently associated with location of death. Let's move forward right up to the very present day. This is hot off the press research conducted by my colleagues Gawai and Irene Higginson and other colleagues here but again suggests that there is a very very strong association between deprivation, this time recorded using the index of material deprivation, and place of death. Those from the most materially deprived backgrounds dying less frequently at home and less frequently in hospice settings than their wealthier peers. So there are lots of complex associations related to this particular issue. Some of them may be related to Julian Tudor Haar's inverse care law, which focuses down on the notion that the supply of care is inversely related to perceived and actual need. Those with the greatest need are least likely to access it because the physical supply of services just isn't there. There are other important factors as well, and we did some work up in northwest London several years ago in order to understand whether awareness and knowledge of palliative care and related services were related to demographic factors. And we quizzed and surveyed about 252 cancer patients in two hospitals in northwest London to identify from these folk whether they understood the term palliative care. A good number of them suggested that they did. And then to verify that knowledge, to validate that knowledge with open-ended sections. And after that, we judged those comments. Very importantly, only a fifth of our respondents provide us with an accurate definition of what palliative care represented, according to the WHO definition. But after that, using regression analysis, we wanted to work out which demographic factors, postcode which provide us with a, a proxy for their, their levels of deprivation, their age, their gender, their ethnicity, which of those factors might be closely and independently associated with knowledge of palliative care? And what we can see here is that deprivation, or coming from the least deprived parts of Harrow and Brent, were most closely associated with having a stock of knowledge about what palliative care would do for people. Eight times more likely to know what it was all about. But the problem is, in relation to this wonderful chart here, as we march into the possibility of experiencing very long periods after our retirement, very long periods of good health, but increasingly long periods of poor health and frailty and a shopping basket of comorbidities and dementia. Many of us in this room will experience dementia or will care for somebody with dementia. Every seven seconds, there's a new case. And that, I've had this slide on the screen for about 21 seconds, that's three new cases. So if that weren't an insult enough, there's a very strong suggestion that palliative care is ageist. And if we start to examine the evidence and appraise the evidence, there are a number or an increasing number of studies and systematic reviews that have attempted to unpick who gets what as they march from one decade to the next. Some very interesting work put together by Jenny Burt in the systematic review here. Gun Grand's work, I think, is incredibly important in understanding who has access to inpatient as well as community-based specialist palliative care in their eighth and ninth decades, again suggesting that those who are amongst the oldest old 
are less likely to access hospices and less likely to be recipients of community-based specialist palliative care. And if we march into the latest work produced by Julia Addington Hall and Catherine Hunt as part of the Voices survey, there's a very strong suggestion here that those who are amongst the oldest old were less likely to be questioned around their preferences for location of death. And there was an increasing likelihood that those in their eighth and ninth decades were less likely to die at home. Going back to Barbara Gomez's work from the PRISMA study, most people would prefer to die at home. And her work has also suggested that as people work through their decades, an increasing proportion of people would prefer to die at home. So there's a disconnect here which warrants some degree of, degree of attention. What about pain? It's not for nothing that Albert Schweitzer suggested that pain is an even worse enemy than death itself. It's a symptom which is incredibly prevalent in the most advanced stages of cancer, up to about 97%, based on the systematic review that Richard Hardy, Irene Higginson, and Solano and Gomez put together several years ago. But there's increasing evidence, certainly from the work from the States by Burnaby, that suggests that those in their eighth and ninth decades are not likely to get any analgesia to manage their cancer at all. And work from the GPRD data that Irene Higginson and Gao Wei have recently analysed and published in the JCO that suggests that those in their eighth and ninth decades will be very unlikely to get adequate or satisfactory doses of opioids to manage their cancer-related pain. This should silence you. It silences me because these are an unvocal population. What about ethnicity? These are lovely slides put together by Benetton way back in the early 1990s. And the piece in relation to diversity in the UK is fascinating now. An increasing number of people from incredibly diverse populations. London has seen the largest growth in people from black, Asian and minority ethnic communities over the last 10 years from one census point to the next. This is work which we recently published through Marie Curie to identify where we're going in relation to ethnicity and palliative care over the next decade. <coughs> Looking at population ageing across the piece in relation to those from black, Asian and minority ethnic communities and also to critically appraise policy that might redress some of the inequities and inequalities of those at very important or critical moments in their life. This is a quite glib slide here. Death doesn't discriminate. It has 100% prevalence. But your road to death will be different based on your colour of your skin, your ethnicity, your race, your country of birth. Think very carefully about who you are and what experience you might live through. So if we start to think carefully about the research across the piece, most of the work has taken place in the States, where they have very, very large populations of minority ethnic communities. And I think the enthusiasm to engage in this type of work. Again, here that we can see marked disparities in relation to the use of hospice, depending on people's racial groups. I hate that word, but it's a term which is frequently used in the American literature. And what we can see here, after taking into account socioeconomic status, is that there are marked disparities between those who are African-American, non-white Hispanic and Hispanic people and those from Asian backgrounds compared to those who are white American. And what we can see here is that there are the differential or the disparities get more marked in the poorest areas where this research took place. Those from Asian or Pacific Islander backgrounds in the poorest quartiles were 70% less likely to have benefited or to have accessed hospice care. Again, that should silence you. This is hot off the press. This is research which was just released two weeks ago in PLOS Medicine, where my colleagues Irene Higginson, Gaway, and Joanna Davis attempted to examine country of birth across 94,000 cancer deaths in London over a 10-year period. Now, we've had to focus on country of birth because that's the only proxy for ethnicity in current death registration data. There are problems with that, which I'm going to have to live with over the next several decades. So what we needed to focus on was first-generation migrants. Because when you register the death of a decedent, you'll be asked for their country of origin or country of birth, not their self-assigned ethnicity. 
So what we did was to group people's country of births into discrete or parsimonious groupings, those who were born in the UK, in Ireland, in Europe, Asia and other, and then to examine, using Poisson regression, what factors independently contributed towards dying in different settings. And what we can see here is that people who come from the Caribbean, first generation migrants, are less likely to die at home compared to white people, compared to all other settings. People from white UK settings or born in the UK are the reference group. Hospice, again very interesting. Those who come from the Asian subcontinent, who come or were born in Africa, and others which would include people from China, are less likely to die in hospices compared to those born in the UK, compared to all other settings. And then lastly, hospital settings, the least preferred setting based on the PRISMA work. What we see here is that those from Asia, those born in the Caribbean, and those born in Africa are more likely to die in hospital settings compared to the reference group, compared to all other settings. Does that make sense? You're up to speed with that? That's great. So what do we do now? Going back to this notion that pain is a symptom that eclipses all other symptoms, we know from previous work by Burnaby, from Galway and Irene, that age is an independent factor associated with the availability and, the, and benefiting from opioids at critical moments in people's advanced disease. But what we also know from the states here is that the availability of opioids, based on geography, is critical in terms of who gets what. The states have covered the piece so elegantly. The work by Charles Cleland and Karen Anderson suggests that those who come from black, Asian and minority ethnic communities, principally those who are African American and non-white Hispanic, will be less likely to be prescribed opioids for cancer compared to their white peers. But the work by Sean Morrison has attempted to understand the availability of the opioids across New York City in relation to the presence of people who come from minority ethnic communities in areas which have a high preponderance or a high proportion of minority ethnic communities the availability of, pharma of opioids in those pharmacies is far less than those where the proportion of white people exists a high proportion of white people now Sean Morrison and colleagues suggest that there's some a whole range of different factors <coughs> Principally, these are poor areas where there's a strong suggestion that these pharmacies may be robbed. There are issues around remuneration and also issues in relation to the misuse of drugs, controlled drugs. I quite like the work by Carmen Green here, which has attempted to take this kind of analysis one stage further, and this time control for socioeconomic status based on zip code, a bit like our postcode here, which provides us with a proxy for the index of material deprivation. Diana, you're looking very anxiously at this slide here. No, just, trying to see. just trying to see it. I think we've given you all these slides. But what she's done here is to compare the availability of opioids in pharmacies for different zip codes. Now, those in the highest area these are white people in areas which are populated by white people principally, have odds ratios of about 13.5%. It becomes far more pronounced in those who live in the poorest areas. Again, if we take arbitrage fights, the sentiment that pain is a worse enemy than death itself, this should make you anxious. These are moments that can't be undone. Why should any of this matter? This is a photograph of a health centre which, as I cycle home past the Elephant and Castle, it, um, it struck me one day, so I took a photograph of it. The health of the people is the highest law. We should be bothered by this. Half a million people will die in the UK every year. Those deaths will be surrounded by at least four to five people, at the very least. People need to be incredibly selective about their cause of death and they need to be incredibly selective about who they are in relation to how old they are, when they die, what disease they have, their social class and their ethnicity, amongst many other factors. But we don't have that privilege. 
And if we go back to this issue of horizontal and vertical equity, we need to address some of the imbalances and some of the crucial issues which are critical as people advance through their progressive disease and the memories that will linger with those who are bereaved. I'll leave you with one quote from Harvey Chochinov. Well, first of all, I never know who wrote this, but I think it's one which has resonance all the time. Harvey says, unfortunately, in end-of-life care, we don't have a vocal constituency. The dead are no longer able to speak. The dying often can't speak, and the bereaved often are too overcome to lose or have loss of speak. These issues are amplified among certain population groups. And I think the rest of the day may attempt to find some solutions to some of the evidence that I've presented here this morning. Thank you very much indeed.